What I'm trying to say is, what if migraine gen is actually just low CSF pressure gen? Well guys, I have sort of been hiding something from you, and that is that I suspect I have a cerebrospinal fluid leak, or a CSF leak for short. I think that my cerebrospinal fluid has been dripping down the back of my nose, into my nose and throat, for years. In this video, I'm going to tell you why I suspect it, what kinds of symptoms I'm having that are making me think that this could be it, what tests I've done at home, why it took me so long to find out myself, and why it took me so long to tell you, and where I'm at in the process of trying to get this diagnosed. Oh, the baby's crying. Hold on. Oh boy, here we go again, attempting to hold the baby while we film. It went so well last time. Cerebrospinal fluid, which I'm going to call CSF from now on, is the fluid that surrounds your brain and your spinal cord and keeps it all cushy in there. It's supposed to be at a very specific pressure. I don't know what that pressure is. And if it's above or below that, you can be symptomatic or it can be dangerous. If you haven't seen my chronic migraine diagnosis story, you should probably start there. I'll put a card right here. In that, I told you guys about my symptom onset timeline for chronic migraine and being diagnosed with that. And I might have talked about getting diagnosed with POTS in that video as well. I'm not sure. But in that video, I talked... Are you going to talk in the video too? I got distracted by the baby. I'm back. Um, in that video, I talked about how my symptom onset at the very beginning was in the middle of 2016, and it was ear fullness, ear ringing, ear pain, and it slowly morphed into all of the other things at the very beginning of 2017, and that was when I got diagnosed with chronic migraine. It is now the beginning of 2021, so it's been many years <laughs> that I've been dealing with these symptoms, and I still don't know exactly why I'm having my chronic migraines. Honestly, for a while, I gave up on finding a reason why. I gave up on um, really knowing what was causing them because a lot of people just have chronic migraine disease. A lot of people just get them, and it's just part of your makeup, and that's okay. But I guess for some people, there is a concrete reason that it's happening, and I was really shocked when I got a message in my DMs on Instagram back in September of 2020. One of my followers, someone from here or something, found me and said, hey, you know, your symptoms really seem to match my mom's symptoms. And she ended up having this thing called a CSF leak. Do you mind if I connect you to, I can give her your Instagram handle and you can see if maybe she's able to help you with seeing if that's what you're going through too. And guys, I usually really dislike the unsolicited advice that happens from being online. Because even though a lot of it does end up helping, a lot of it is like, oh, just take ginger for your migraines and your migraines will just go away. And okay, yeah, the ginger thing, it's totally working for me. But the point is, it gets annoying to get that like constantly. It's a lot. A lot of times I get messages that are like, oh, Jen, I got diagnosed with this, this, that, and you kind of have this symptom, so maybe you have this disease. And it's like, okay, but you don't know my whole medical history, so there's other stuff that plays into getting that diagnosis, and maybe there's a reason I haven't gotten that diagnosis. But when it came to the CSF leak thing, I did a quick little Google search before I agreed to talk to the um, person's mom, and it did actually match really well, so I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and look into this a little bit more. Okay. So I started learning about CSF. A couple of things I found that were interesting. She distracts me. I don't know what my sentence was. Okay, I'm gonna see if Dad. Ah! <coughs> exactly. I'm gonna see if Dad's available. I'll be right back. I'm back. This isn't when I was intending to tell you about it, but my nose is now dripping fluid, so I need to excuse myself again to go wipe off this fluid from my nose. And this is the side of filming and life that I've been hiding from you guys, I think, the most. This clear fluid is dripping out of my nose, like, all the time. And I don't really have a history of allergies. I don't get seasonal allergies. And I do live in a new place now, so I could have allergies from that. But this isn't happening when I'm going outside. This is happening when I'm bending over. But hold on, I'll be back. 
So, your CSF fluid is supposed to hang out around your brain and around your spinal column. There are two different main classes of CSF leaks. One is cranial, which is when it's coming out of like your brain dura part, and then the other is spinal, which is it's somewhere in your spinal column. And a leak in either place can make you symptomatic. If I do have a leak, then I suspect I'm in the cranial category because it comes out of my nose and goes down my throat and I can taste it. The taste of the fluid is kind of salty, kind of metallic. And my complaints of this salty and metallic taste go back all the way to February or March of 2017 when I emailed my doctor at Stanford and told her that I was tasting something metallic in my mouth and that it was freaking me out because it was coming at the same time as all of these other symptoms that ended up being the reason I was diagnosed with chronic migraine. You guys know me. I like to take matters into my own hands. And I figured the next best thing to do is try to figure out how I can test this at home or get further evidence before I actually go to a doctor because I didn't want to be labeled as a hypochondriac. I didn't want to go into the doctor and be like, my brain fluid's leaking, help me! Without at least having some idea of anything concrete that I could conjure up at home. And I also don't want to take things seriously just because someone told it to me on the internet. Just because someone says that I seem like I'm consistent doesn't mean that I actually am. And just because most of it matches with my symptoms doesn't mean it's going to be a perfect match. Because a lot of these symptoms are things like brain fog. It's very generic. So, you guys know me. I love data. I love numbers. I was like, let's get something concrete, hopefully, that I can bring into the doctor. And then maybe they'll take me more seriously if I end up convincing myself that this could really be a thing. Full transparency, I'm dripping again, so I will be blowing my nose again and cutting it out. You guys have no idea how many sniffles I cut out when I edit. <laughs> you cut out every time you say, um, you cut out every time you pause for a while, and for me, I have to cut out every time I sniffle. Okay, um, what's next? So this lady contacts me and she says, you know what, let me hook you up with this Facebook group. There are quite a few groups on Facebook, actually, of people who either have confirmed CSF leaks or who suspect that they might have a CSF leak, and everybody talks about what doctor they went to or what tests they got done or what tests were negative before they got their positive for a leak or all sorts of stuff like that. You know, typical Facebook group. Got an itch. So I joined a couple of those, started browsing, started looking at the symptoms that they were talking about, and of course, I googled the symptoms on my own. Wait for it. During my browsing in the Facebook groups, I found something very freaking interesting, and that is that there's an at-home test using a glucometer, like a normal $30 Amazon glucometer, to test the fluid in your nose to see if what's coming out has high glucose. And the idea behind this test is that there is glucose in your cerebrospinal fluid and there is not in your nasal drippings, or not very much. Lucky me, I was pregnant at the time that I got this message from the lady. And during pregnancy, you get checked for gestational diabetes. I still had my glucose monitor. Oh, you know what? I gotta tell you one more thing about that. You can either go in, chug 50 grams of sugar, and then get your blood drawn later on that day as your diabetes test, or you can do an at-home, prick your finger for like a week, see how it goes. Um, you, you prick your finger in the morning to get your fasting glucose, and then two hours after each meal to get your, oh gosh, it's this complicated word that starts with a P that means after you ate. Does it even start with a P? You guys know what the word is. Put it in the comments. I know I have like tons of nurses on here. Tell me what that word was. So I happened to have a glucose meter at my house. And I took a clip about this yesterday because I thought I was going to film this whole video yesterday. And then kiddo got in the way of that. But I'm going to jump now to a clip of using the glucose meter yesterday. And hopefully it fits into the video about here. This might get choppy, but check out this clip. Hard to do because I only have so many hands, but we'll do this one-handed. So it beeps to say that it's on and it's ready to go. Hello, there's me. Literally just like hold it up to the nasal drip. It 
and it's got high glucose. And I guess you can probably see, let me turn that. This is totally an embarrassing thing to show you guys, but you can probably see that I've got like this really, this, oh here, I can feel it dripping. Tiny amount of clear fluid that's dripping. It's freaking constant. Can you see it? Yeah, there you go. I swear it's constant and it drives me freaking mad. And oh, there I am. Hi. Hi. It drives me crazy because actually I should blow my nose first. Hold on. Excuse me, geez. Um, it's even harder now with the baby because I'm constantly bending down to pick her up and then standing back up. And that's just making it worse. I feel like postpartum, all this dripping is just so much worse. And it makes it really frustrating because like if I want to breastfeed her, I look down and then of course it starts dripping or I have to pump. So I look down and it starts dripping or I don't know, you guys can imagine. I'm like looking down and bending down all the time now. So it's just driving me crazy. And then I try to film a video. I bend down to plug in a light, stand up, have to go blow my nose again. And then after all the nose blowing, my nose is all red and I start to film and then my nose is all red. Baby's crying, so I gotta go, um, but we'll pick this up later. Bye. High glucose fluid coming out of the nose. I have had a really hard time finding anything else that could describe this. I have only found that it is indicative of a CSF leak. And I know that there are some doctors who are not in my state, unfortunately, who take any reading over 30 on a glucose meter as a very good indication that you are probably leaking CSF fluid. I don't know why 30. I don't know what other options could be, but seriously guys, if any of you have any idea what else this could be, I wanna know what the heck is going on because your nasal is only supposed to be under 10, I think, 10 whatever the units are and I've gotten up to almost 300 in my nose and I have no diabetes, so it's not like blood contamination. We know that because my blood glucose never goes over 115, 120. I'm a scientist. I like to do things scientifically. So I started doing this test over and over and over again at different times to see when I was getting this glucose rating and when I wasn't. Couple of things I learned. If I bend down and then stand back up, so I pick up the baby, I do the dishes, something like that. It's gonna have glucose in it, every time. If I exert myself, like I come running up the stairs and then it drips, it's gonna be glucose, high glucose, every time. Let's see what else. If I go out in the cold and then come back in and my nose runs from that, not glucose. If I ball my eyes out and I'm crying, usually not glucose. So, like, all these things also kind of make me feel like it could be a CSF leak because when you're outside and it's cold, it's natural to get a runny nose or if your tears are running, like, that's just normal nasal stuff. That shouldn't be a CSF leak thing. That shouldn't be brain fluid. But if you're bending over, then maybe it's increasing the pressure in the head and it's making your nose drip. Maybe that can happen with exercise, too. I don't really know. I hadn't heard of CSF leaks until... This woman messaged me in September of 2020, but my complaints of symptoms that match it have been since 2016. I'm not dead set on this being what's going on in me, but if it is what's going on in me, I want to find out. I want to find out now. I want to find out definitively, and I want to get my freaking answers because I've already been symptomatic for this for five years, and that is four and a half years too many. If I have a leak, I believe that it's minor and intermittent. I don't always have this drip coming out of my nose. I have good weeks and bad weeks, and my symptoms are completely different when I'm dripping versus when I'm not dripping. I looked it up on the Facebook groups and on different, like, you know, peer-reviewed stuff, trying to read research articles, but also look at some anecdotal things, and it sounds like it is possible for that to happen. And some people, if they're leaking intermittently, they will alternate between the symptoms of high cranial pressure and low cranial pressure. So like the leak will be leaking and you get low pressure in your brain, so you get whatever symptoms come with that. And then the leak pauses for a little bit, but your brain is used to making fluid faster than it actually has to because it's always trying to catch up for that leak. So when the leak closes itself for a little bit, then the pressure rises, 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 and you get the symptoms that are associated with that. This is all a theory. This is not confirmed. This is like my theory that I have put together. My migraines come in this very interesting cyclical pattern where I go to bed, I wake up in post which is after your migraine attack phase. 
I have a good time in the middle of the day, or my best time. I'm usually still symptomatic. And then nearing the afternoon and evening, I start to decline, like clockwork. When I got pregnant, I noticed that on the days that I took naps, I didn't decline quite as much in the afternoon. And I think that was because I was taking the time to lay down, allow the pressure to build back up, before standing back up and experiencing all that leaking again. Just a guess. Next obvious step, look at the symptoms of high pressure, look at the symptoms of low pressure, see how they match with my ebbs and flows. Check this out. Symptoms of high cranial pressure. Unfortunately, the high cranial... Shh. Unfortunately, most of the high pressure symptoms are really generic, so I don't really put a lot of weight on them, but it's headache, blurred vision, feeling less alert than usual, vomiting, changes in your behavior, weakness or problems with moving or talking, and lack of energy or sleepiness. So this is definitely how I feel in post-drome, how I feel when I wake up after having a migraine attack the night before. And I really just find these symptoms to be too generic to actually be able to draw any conclusions from them. So let's go to the symptoms of low pressure. Symptoms of low cranial pressure. What's interesting about the symptoms of low pressure is they describe migraine gen really well. And if my theory is right, then it could be that over the day, my pressure could be lowering and lowering and lowering and bringing me into more of a state of confusion. What I'm trying to say is, what if migraine gen is actually just low CSF pressure gen? That would really suck, obviously. But if that's all it is, then let's fix it and move on with our life, you know? So check this out. I told you guys before, my neck gets super stiff. My neck hurts basically all the time. And when I'm not pregnant or breastfeeding, I actually take prescription baclofen to help me with the pain that I get in my neck. Baclofen is a muscle relaxer. I've been taking that as needed since 2017. And my neck always only gets bad enough for a baclofen when I'm having a migraine attack. Sketchy. Ringing in your ears, change in hearing, and dizziness. Guys. If that's not migraine gen to a T, I don't know what is. And actually, the very first thing that I went to the hospital for when my symptoms onset at the beginning was ear pain. I had fullness in my ear, my ear was ringing all the time, my hearing was muffled, and I was having dizziness that was so bad that it was making me nauseous and giving me vomiting. But the first six months was just this ear pain muffled hearing stuff. Nausea and vomiting, just talked about that. Gait unsteadiness. Vertigo. I told you guys just a few weeks ago about my adventures with vestibular therapy because I wasn't able to walk on my own anymore. Gait unsteadiness. Vertigo. What? Guys. Diplopia. What's that? Diplopia. Double vision. Guys! That's also in the vestibular therapy video. Double vision. Yes. Have that. Again, that's something that I have during migraines. Ah, give me back my pressure list. Symptoms of low CSF pressure. I'm totally turning into like my mom with a cell phone, but now it's me and I'm the mom having trouble with a cell phone. Isn't that cute? Trouble with memory or cognitive function. We know that doesn't apply to migraine gen. Migraine gen has perfect memory and excellent cognitive function. So we can just ignore that one. And movement disorders such as chorea or Parkinsonism. Now I don't remember what Choreo was, but you guys know that I suffer from POTS, so I get tachycardia, I get drops in blood pressure, and I occasionally faint. When I faint, sometimes it's syncope, syncope, it's always syncope when you faint. Sometimes it's convulsive, and that matches Parkinsonism. And I don't remember what Choreo was, I looked it up like many months ago. Choreo. Korea, I am probably butchering so many of these. A movement disorder that causes involuntary, regular, unpredictable muscle movements. The disorder can make you look like you're dancing. Oh yeah, yeah, I don't have that. That's the one where you, um, you sort of have a walk to you. And that doesn't happen to me. But I do get the Parkinsonism one where you shake. And it's not Parkinson's. Parkinsonism, it sounds like is just tremors. And we know that I get tremors. I get them during migraines. Another reason I think this is a pretty consistent diagnosis for me is that I do have positional headache. Sometimes if I lay down, my head will start throbbing, literally throbbing. I can feel my heartbeat and it hurts and I have to stand up to make it feel better. Or 
Sometimes when I lay down, it's the only way to escape the headache that I feel when I'm standing up. And I don't, I don't know enough about what's low pressure symptoms and what's high pressure symptoms, but I know that having those positional headaches is one of the biggest indicators of a CSF leak. And actually one more symptom that didn't come up on here that I know I mentioned before in my chronic migraine diagnosis story video that I mentioned at the very beginning of this video. Whoa, that was a sentence. In that same time frame, the beginning of 2017, when I told my doctor that I had the metallic taste, I also went to my eye doctor because my neurologist was taking a really long time. They weren't taking me seriously when I told them that I felt like I was having really concerning um, symptoms in my head, like the metallic taste. So the eye doctor, they can look and take pictures in your eyeballs to see how your optic nerve looks. And if your optic nerve is pushed against the back of your eyeball from something like increased cranial pressure, then it has blurry edges around the edges, blurry lines around the edges instead of clear lines around the edges. And that is something that my eye doctor noted. She said that it looked like I might have increased pressure, but then by the time I went to the doctor to get my MRI and everything, my pressure and all that looked normal again. Again, sort of just fits this narrative of maybe my pressure was high when I went to the eye doctor, and maybe it did drop later, or maybe it's only moderately high, so my MRI does look normal, because I've never actually gotten a lumbar puncture to see what my actual pressure is, so. Oh, but I read that getting your lumbar puncture to get the actual rating can give you a leak, which is ironic. And um, having a pressure that's in normal range is probably actually pretty likely for me if I am fluctuating up and down and up and down. And it probably is in range, out of range, in range, out of range, or stays in range, but is just a little bit wonky, like wonky enough that I can feel it, but not wonky enough that it's getting picked up on really crude tests, like just taking a picture. You know what I mean? But again, I'm no expert. So where am I in the process of getting diagnosed for this? Well, this timeline gets a little bit hairy, so bear with me. September 2020 is when I got that message that I should look into CSF leaks. The end of September was when I got that positive glucose sample for the first time, and I was like, ding, this could really be it. So then I started trying to find a doctor who could treat me, and unfortunately, there just aren't a lot of doctors in my area, period. And there certainly aren't a lot of doctors who know the ins and outs of finding, diagnosing, and treating a CSF leak. So it took a long time to find a neurosurgeon. Like, I had to even leave my normal network of doctors and hospitals because they don't have somebody in their network even. I don't mean, like, my insurance network, but my, um, my hospital network. Their network of buildings that they have. So it took weeks to even get connected to a doctor who treats CSF leaks which honestly I wasn't expecting at all. Since I was having a lot of trouble finding a neurosurgeon, I actually ended up going to an ENT first. I guess a lot of leaks, if you're able to access it through the nose, you can go ahead and treat it that way. So I went to the only ENT that I could find in my area who knows anything about CSF leaks. And unfortunately, man, he was the most dismissive doctor I've probably ever been to. I walked in and he said, well, it sounds like you think you know this is exactly what you have. And I was like, oh boy, it's gonna be one of those appointments. It's really hard going to the doctor over and over and asking if you can be tested for something and having them brush you off because you must just be a crazy lady who looks up all your symptoms and thinks that you have everything because, you know, I don't know, whatever. Ugh. So he really didn't take me seriously and unfortunately he was also misinformed I scienced the crap out of this doctor, guys. He even tried printing out a paper talking about how even normal people can have glucose in their nasal drips, and I had to point out to him that that paper was talking about people having glucose in their nasal drips that are under a level of 10, whatever the units are. Mine was much higher than that, so what does he think that it is? And he pulled out some fancy words, fancy words, and I asked him, okay, whatever those mean, how do we test for them? And of course, there's nothing he can do about it because why would we want to diagnose the woman who's having all of these problems and is severely disabled? So I fired him. If you don't like your doctor, you never have to go back again. You can fire them. Meanwhile, while I was waiting for that appointment, I was also trying to get in with a neurosurgeon. They said that they needed an MRI with and without contrast that was within the last six months. But mine was a year old. And I was pregnant, so I couldn't get a new one with contrast. I asked them if they would be willing to make an exception so that I could just go in and get other tests done that I could do while I was pregnant just to get the show on the road because I had another three months left of the baby cooking. 
And they said, yeah, sure, just get it without contrast and we'll go ahead put you on the books and we'll just get it with contrast later on if the doctor decides that it's necessary. We'll go ahead and make an exception. I thought, oh, awesome, great. So a couple weeks later, whatever, I went ahead and got my MRI. You guys know that migraines and MRI are not friends. Migraines are so sensitive to big noises and stuff like that and MRIs are so loud. So of course it triggers a migraine and it's not a good experience, but I did it because I figured I would be able to go in to see the doctor. My MRI was in October. I spent all of November trying to get my primary care doctor to successfully get a referral into this neurosurgeon and we weren't able to. Finally, by the end of November, it happened. Then instead of wanting to schedule my appointment, the doctor kept asking me for an MRI with contrast and I kept needing to bother them back saying, I can't give you an MRI with contrast right now, I'm pregnant. And then, boom, I had a baby. That threw a wrench in the plans again because now I don't have the excuse of being pregnant so I can't go get an MRI with contrast. Now they're like, um, sorry, but you, you need an MRI with contrast. You don't have an excuse anymore. You really just need to go get your MRI. Guys, I literally got an MRI for you three months ago and you're making me go get another MRI. But you know what? This is how it has to happen. So I went and got my MRI with contrast, suffered the consequences again, and got on the books. So now I am waiting to go in for my appointment with the neurosurgeon. Am I excited? Yes. Am I more nervous than excited? Totally. And am I hopeful? Guys, I'm so nervous that I'm just gonna get there and get brushed off again, and if that happens, then I'm gonna have to go out of state in order to actually be taken seriously for this, that this is something that should be tested for. Again, I'm not hell-bent on having it. I don't care whether or not I have it, but we need to take this seriously, and we need to actually look into it. That's literally all I'm asking. There are tests that the doctor can do to see whether it actually is CSF fluid in your nose versus some other type of fluid. But unfortunately, the tests aren't very reliable because the sample isn't very stable once you collect it. And since I don't leak very much out of my nose, I'm not really able to provide a sample that's large enough for them to actually test it. If a doctor does decide to look into this for me, I'm going to have to test it some other way. Now this dismissive ENT, we call him the duck doctor because the mask that he was wearing stuck straight out like a duck and that's mean. Just don't tell him, okay? It was his mask, it wasn't him. He did humor me during that appointment and look up endoscopically to see if he could see any tearing or anything and he didn't see anything unusual when he just scoped up my nose. And he also sent home a little container so that if I did ever leak enough fluid, I could put it in that container. But unfortunately, I just, I don't leak enough. He wasn't aware of the test that you can do for smaller samples. Um, there's one called Pledgets, where they put little, basically little tampons up your nose and it collects more fluid than you can get from small amounts of dripping. But I guess he hadn't heard of those, so <laughs> I don't know why he was the, specialist, the ENT specialist for CSF leaks in my area that just, he hadn't heard of pledgets. He also told me that if I'm leaking so little that I don't generate the couple of teaspoons or whatever that they wanted for the test, then there's no way that I would be symptomatic. And I thought that was just a really inappropriate thing to say to a patient. And I think you guys understand that. But honestly, he was so on my nerves at that point from really just trying to prove me wrong at every turn instead of trying to listen and answer questions or what he thought it could have been instead. I really didn't feel like he was a doctor that I could work with on the long haul. Like I didn't feel like it was worth it to convince him like, okay, well look at this data and this data and this data, so we should do this test. Like it just didn't feel like that was going to be a productive thing to do because I didn't feel like his pride was going to allow that to happen. Like once he started pulling out papers that weren't even relevant to what was going on, like just because it was testing nasal glucose doesn't mean it's relevant here at all. Like if you're in a range of zero to 10 testing glucose in a paper and we're talking 50 to 300, like the percentage of people who fall in this range is not relevant. He should not have brought that up. And I, I just don't think he would have been willing to see eye to eye with me even if I had convinced him that he was right because once people are like adamant about something they don't want to admit fault that's just how people are 
And I think especially doctors. I think it's hard for doctors when a patient comes in super educated, super scientific, um, really curious and really well read. I think it's a little bit intimidating. I think there are a couple of other little home tests that you can do, like on a brown paper bag or something, and something with the rings when it dries is supposed to indicate something. But I actually haven't done that test, and I probably should. Ooh, I wonder if there's any connection to CSF leaks and POTS. CSF leaks and POTS. POTS, spinal CSF leak, or both. Poweroverpots.com says, be aware, serious POTS imposter, CSF leaks. Oh my gosh, I'm so dying to find out if this is what's happening. Because if this can get cured, that's... What am I gonna do with all the time and the spoons? And I can be there for my daughter, I can be there for Buddy. Oh my gosh, guys, all of this. This is overwhelming. StanfordHealthcare.org, young woman overcomes multiple misdiagnoses and gets her life back. Orthostatic headache or headache that's worse than upright is a key feature of a CSF leak, but it's also a common feature in patients with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So yeah, um, Matches with POTS too, so I I think we could be onto something here guys, and I'm really excited to find out. And I'm sorry that it took me so long to tell you. I really just don't want to be a hypochondriac, constantly coming onto YouTube being like, guys, I think I found my cause. Like, guys, I think I found my misdiagnosis. Guys, I think I know what's wrong with me. If I'm just constantly coming on here being like, oh my gosh, what if it's this, or what if it's that? I just, I don't want to mislead you, and I don't want to lose credibility. So that's why I haven't said anything. I just wanted to wait until I was a little bit more sure. But now it's taking so long to get there that I figure it's time to just spill the beans now and let you guys come on the ride with me. You guys will figure this out as I do. There's my update. Now you know. And I really hope that soon we can get to the bottom of this. I'll update you when I know more. That's a crazy video with a lot of information, but I think we nailed it. Yeah.